Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted again to be able to speak to accomplished fund manager Chris McVeigh of Octopus Investments. So, welcome, Chris. Good morning, Paul. Yeah, good. Yeah, we've we've got an absolute sort of deluge of key macro information coming out this week, not least decisions from the Bank of uh, Japan, Federal Reserve, Bank of England, alongside the UK CPI print and a series of corporate uh, results as well. So putting all that together, what's your sort of outlook for equities going forward for the rest of the year, especially in your sort of sweet spot of small caps? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot will depend on interest rates with regards to small caps. We saw it towards the back end of last year. We saw strong performance uh, in, in both November and December last year as interest rates um, were, were largely to, the conclusion was they were they will be cut by now, I think, with some of the, the, yes. the commentators, but clearly it hasn't happened. So we're in a bit of a holding pattern right now. Um, we still expect rates to, to be cut at some point this year. Um, whether we go first or whether we wait for the Fed is, is, is a bit of a discussion point. Um, but certainly from a UK perspective, we, we do still expect rates to, to start to come down at middle of this year. Um, and, and you know, growth equities, risk assets such as um, small mid caps, we'd expect them to, to start to outperform again once that happens. Mm. And just in terms of the sort of small cap sector, I mean, one of the sort of like, you know, major drags this year, not only obviously yield curves have, just, have ticked up because interest rate expectations have been pushed to the right, but more so actually in terms of, you know, fund manager, fund manager redemptions. Are you still still seeing that? I mean, not not typically the octopus, but just across the industry, because I'd have, I'd have thought and most investors would have suspected that, you know, we'd have started seeing some recycled cash coming in from the M and A boom we've had at the end of last year, which would then be pushing up the markets. But it just doesn't seem to have happened for the first three months. It's been it's been all one way, sort of damp and quite soggy. Yeah, look, not yet. We we certainly haven't seen um, money coming back into our end of the market. Um, but it the you know, data would still suggest that there is still money coming out as only was towards the back end of last year. But it, you know, I don't. We don't feel it to the same degree we felt it last year. I think it was quite persistent, consistent capital coming out of our markets. Um, it feels much more, again, that holding pattern comment, it feels that's where we are just now. People mm. not taking money out really because they believe what we believe, that the market's are a really interesting valuation point. But the, the FOMO hasn't yet kicked in, um, which which tends to drive uh, these sorts of assets, especially especially at the smaller end, so people are sitting on their on their hands right now. But at least back to that that interest rate question, we saw people taking money out of the markets last year to buy money market funds. Um, you know that trade has arguably been done, and if rates are starting to progress back towards some semblance of normality, you'd expect people to be thinking about asset allocation and looking towards places where they can make substantial potential capital returns and, and smaller uh, UK equities are, are potentially one of those areas. So, um, I, you know, we, we're not seeing the inflows. We're not seeing the FOMO yet, but but it feels to me to me be in a much more stable position compared to where we were, say, middle of last year. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. It's a matter, it should be, in theory, a matter of when, mm. not if. And it's yeah. just it's sort of like just waiting it out whilst this sort of like, you know, oasis period is... He's sort of drawing, uh, finishing off. Okay, well, let's move to some sort of stocks. Let's go to uh, software and tech services because there's some real sort of like beautiful gems down in the small cap area. Let's go start with Active Ops, which is having a bit of a sort of like a, you know, a, a, a breakthrough year actually. It does um, robotic automation software for banks, insurers, and uh, most of the recur most of the revenues are recurring. Um, it's just entering sort of profitability. Like for like sales have been around sort of ten percent, high single digits, etc. Eighty percent plus gross margin so a lot of drop through and uh it's got a rock solid balance sheet 75 million market cap what's sort of your latest on this one yeah, well, i think rather than robotics it's more workforce optimization it's 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 workforce capacity planning software it's enabling yeah. companies to to monitor personnel efficiency efficiency um you know staff availability demand forecasting etc enables the managers to, to 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 you know plan what they need who they need where they need it so it's all about resource planning, operational efficiency. And you say it is starting to see, um, you know, it's been on the market for a couple of years, had a bit of a bumpy period initially, 
Um, it, it, it obviously came down quite some way in 2022. The shares are now up 11% or so year to date. Um, we're starting to see that that like for like growth progress. I think it was up 16% actually at last count from the, the mm -hmm. numbers, are, are, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Uh, that's despite a tricky micro environment. So, you know, they are growing. They're growing well. Um, the, the great thing about this business really is its high level of recurring revenues. I think 90% um, of, of the, the revenues this business has been generating are recurring in, in, in some nature. Um, and, and therefore, you, you tend to allocate a higher valuation to a business which has got a substantially higher proportion of recurring revenues. You know, looking at its price to earnings multiple, you're going to say to me, Chris, this is on 95 times to March 25. <laughs> what are you talking about? Why are you holding this? Well, basically, it's on two times EV to sales. Yeah. So you'd expect a business like this with, you know, good levels of growth and, and that high level of recurring uh, revenues to trade on more like four to five times on a, a normal market. So, you know, it's still very cheap from that perspective. It's just breaking through the profitability, as you say, hence why that, that price earnings multiple looks inflated right now. But it's got good balance sheet. And you meet the management team and, and you, you, the, their tails are up. They, I think they're they're finding... You know, life quite exciting now, and, and the opportunities that they, they see as they go forward from here. So I think this business is in extremely good shape. Good. Okay. Well, that's great to hear. Okay. Well, let's move to um, another one in the similar sort of like uh, uh, sector, but it's net call. It's a bit further along the line in terms of generating profit, still growing well. It basically, I think it started sort of like call center software and has branched yeah. out into sort of automation, but it helps um, sort of like, you know, uh, healthcare come, well, basically help the NHS and legal in general and Lloyd's and people like that um, <clears throat> better process all the inbound and customer service queries and this sort of stuff. Do you want to take us through this one? Because again, it seems to be doing pretty well. It's on a slightly higher valuation, just over three times sales, but yeah. it's, it's pretty profitable. It is, uh, yes. You're right. It is for the that, 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 well, that life cycle as far as development goes. 150 million market cap company, roughly here. Um, call centers initially, but the business now suggests that the group is increasingly seen as a one-stop shop for for digital transformation or dig they call it the digital transformation toolkit. So um, it, it is helping companies to to move into that that you know digital, digital transformation of enterprises, reducing costs, driving efficiencies as as you'd expect. Um, it's also about cloud as well. They've been investing in their cloud platform and, and cloud revenues, I think are up about 20% over the last year, 18 to 20%, the, the wider group is is up eight. So the, the group is growing, but the cloud business, the cloud element of it is growing um uh, much more strongly. Mm. It, it now accounts for about half of sales uh, and, and that's at higher margins, again, helping to drive the margins there. Um, and closed subscriptions, I think, accounted for about 90% of, of new bookings in the last period. So again, this is a real driver for this business. And then taking cloud and, and taking the support services or support contracts the, the business already has in place, they make up about 75% of total revenues. And, and that was about 71% a year ago. So high levels of recurring revenues here again, much like the previous company, increasing levels of recurring revenues again as well. Cash generation here is strong, net cash about 30 million at last count, um, and the cash is expected to continue to build from here. Uh, you say, it's, yeah, it's not cheap. It, it's, I think, I think about 30, 30 times multiple this time, so not the, 50, the, the 95 we had with mm. Active Ops. But um, again, it's that EV to sales multiple that, again, I'd look at here uh, three times, uh, roughly, as you say, again, given the quality of the business, given the order book it has here, I think 58 million of, of, of order book right now against about 40 million of revenues forecast for this year. So again, the, the, the numbers are very much underpinned here. Again, this business should be trading on between four and five times in our view. So again, significant upside from current levels. Let's move on to another one in the uh, in the IT sector that should be doing really well from sort of the migration to cloud and AI, IOMart, but the shares aren't reflecting that. IOMart sort of like owns about 12, I think, data centers in the UK and offers sort of cloud services to small, medium-sized businesses, largely in the UK, but there's also certain ones that are abroad and has actually leases um, some data center space overseas as well in the States and I think in the Middle East. Can you take us through this one? Because I think this seems to be the Achilles heel is, is the growth of it because it should be doing well like all the other cloud providers. You know, I, I think the, the business perhaps it's sort of lost momentum. It, it lost its earnings momentum. It, it perhaps lost its place in the market a couple of years ago. It's a, it's a, a Glasgow-based 
not that I'm biased, but Glasgow based yeah. managed cloud services and hosting business. See, it's got 12 data centers. It's got a, a, a connected network infrastructure, about two and a half thousand kilometers, a well invested business across the UK and it has got global reach, as you say. Um, there was a management change. The, the, the founder manager uh, who is, is still involved as a non-exec stepped away a couple of years ago. The, 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 the replacement CEO, I, I don't think fully um, capitalized on, on, the, on the business. And we've had a new CEO, Lucy Dimes, come into the business about eight months ago from memory. Mm, she's coming up with right. a, much, a, a much clearer strategy. If you look at the the presentation deck, the last one they produced, it does lay out much more cohesively um, the um, the 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 market opportunities they see it and and their position within the market. So I think they they now are starting to to look at where they are, where they sit within the marketplace, and where they can potentially get to. And I think that's starting to you know it, it takes a while to turn these businesses businesses around. But she's focusing on sales, focusing on service. It feels a much more cohesive go to market strategy. It, it could be an, as an inflection point from an earnings perspective here. It's on on 13 times earnings, but it's delivering 13 pence of earnings. If you look back to, to 2019, this business was generating about 19 pence. So mm. material upside if they get this right. Um, and as you say, they're in an interesting place with a good, well-invested asset base, and hopefully they can generate some decent returns from this level. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason that the market's doing well. So uh, if they can get all the pieces working in in unison, then uh, they should should do pretty um, pretty well. Okay, let's move on to another one which has really sort of transformed itself: Pinewood Tech, which is the former um, car dealer dealership stroke d d um, uh, distributor, uh, uh, Pendragon, and yeah. um, it sold off that to the US um, Lithia, Lithia, I think it is, or um, that you know that that business, and therefore it's left it with a sort of like a dealer management software platform that um, has got an embedded uh, 24.5p dividend in it as well. So uh, do you want to take us through this one? Because it does seem to be something that um, is, hasn't yet been sort of like fully priced in. Yeah, I mean, this is, say, car dealership management software. It's been through a, a rather precluded takeover process, that, which has resulted in the business becoming a listed standalone technology enterprise that I don't think many people actually know is here yet. I think it's still yes. to be properly discussed that what you know it's it's SaaS revenues you know it's what we like so good visible earning stream um good margins 25 percent ebit margins in this business in the remaining business uh, and revenue growth uh, they're suggesting about 15 percent uh, compound annual growth over the next couple of years uh, so really attractive multiples from the um dynamics from that perspective one that people haven't really got a handle on that it shares about 38 pence right now um, there is a big dividend due back to shareholders in the next, I think, eight weeks. Yeah, it's 24.5p. Uh, so it's a basically yeah. a blended of like 13 and a half, 14p. Exactly. Um, so therefore, people look at it right now, it looks expensive because ultimately the dividend has got to come out. But on EV, but that's on about 11 times. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's not as super cheap as it was when we first started looking at it. We met it back in December last year. Um, but the real key is whether these estimates can be beaten. And and having met the management team, they think that now they're they're out in the shadows of Pendragon, they can start to sell to other motor groups. And and that's the opportunity for them, both in the UK, Europe, and in, in the US. Um, and also, you know, just from a sense check perspective, we have spoken to um, a couple of leading industry players, chief execs of other motor groups. Um, and, and again, they were upbeat about, about the technology here. So I think there is a strong market position that they currently benefit from. They've got good revenues and good margins right now, good levels of earnings growth and, and potential uh, for significant upside if they can really capitalize on this opportunity. So I think this is really exciting. I'd say no one's talking about it yet. So that's yeah. from our perspective is the sort of things we like to find. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it certainly isn't in the press, that's for sure. So yeah. once they yeah. pay that big dividend out as well, it will get a it will get more um more visibility, I think, with across investors. Okay, good. Let's we'll move to um, sort of media and publishing. We've really got a, a diamond here. It, um, Bloomsbury Publishing. I mean, 
you know, it's sort of the Harry Potter wizardry. And then they've just also, well, they haven't just, but they basically signed up a, a lady in in fiction, um, Sarah Mass, who great, it was just some fantastic sort of like, you know, best-selling books, et cetera, just recently. And um, the shares have, uh, have responded well. What's your latest on this one? I mean, I'm guessing, you know, they have all the licensing for the books and for the, um, you know, the digital rights for the audio books, et cetera. I guess the only long-term thing is, you know, will they be, impacted by ai at all but could you take us through your, your thoughts on this one because it seems to be doing not a foot wrong uh, this has been a it's been a serial upgrader of late um under the steady tenure of, of, of ceo nigel the cfo penny i mean nigel's been in the business uh, i think for probably as long as you and i have been in the markets um paul so he's yeah. been around a long time he's had a great job with this business and it's very much still his business and he's and he's built this fantastic platform harry potter obviously what was the um, the, the 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 diamond that they found years ago that still is almost an annuity income for them, so give them a really good uh, visible earnings stream from that perspective. They've got an education business which is growing um, again. You know, subscription type revenues again, high quality revenues increasingly, which is again a, a, another big tick in the box. And you're right, Sarah J. Mass um, has been uh, the latest uh, win for them, and and she's you know her, her latest book I think reached number one in the U.S., yeah. U.K., Australia. You know, it's it's really um, it, it's been fantastic. They've got a long term deal with 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 her as well. So a number of other books to follow. Um, they're just doing, as you say, they're not putting a foot wrong. Um, we get a for the, the the latest update was you know they are significantly ahead of expectations again, which is great. Um, we get full year results in in May, um, and, and that will be in um, alignment with their twenty thirty strategy presentation at that point as well. Let's see what they say. Um, but um, but you know the business looks in great shape. It's not it's not standout super cheap sixteen times earnings, but mm. for the quality of business it is the recurring revenues, the upside from Sarah J Mass and whomever else they sign in due course as well. This business still feels to us to be in very good shape. Yeah, and I guess the sort of the AI side, the risk is because they've got such premium content, it isn't going to get replicated by a generative AI sort of like you know doing writers being you know being authors or alternatively through the internet discovery on their educational side, I guess. I mean, the, the, with with both sides of those, I mean, you could argue that any good writer could have been replicated by a bad writer through, you know, through yeah, generations true. and decades. And, and there's true. plenty of bad, bad writers around. If you've got good content and good quality talent, um, you can you can monetize it and sell it. And they certainly have that with Sarah J. Maas and a lot of other people they have, they have signed up with. So I'm relaxed on that. On the education side, Again, it you know, who knows what how that might play out in due course, but um with any AI, it's quality in, quality out. And if you yeah. want to ensure you get the best quality education, you want to therefore take it from a quality provider. And I think these guys have that credibility already. So I'd, again, I'd be surprised if that impacts their business. Yeah, no, I would agree. Okay, good. Let's move to your roots, I suppose, STV up in uh, Scotland. And uh, they seem to have really done a, you know, um, grab the ball by the horns and moving towards a digitization strategy. They've got their own production studios and they've got their online streaming platform alongside, obviously, their normal sort of linear terrestrial TV. Do you want to take us through this one? Because, uh, you know, they, they do, do, do seem to be still growing. The margins are coming down a bit, though, I think. I think we have to sort of take a step back from STV. Yes, it's a Glasgow business again. I'm not biased, <laughs> but um, but it, it's a business I think is again under the radar screen. It's 100 million market cap, so six times earnings. Um, the the group is very much in three distinct buckets now. So it was historically just your your, your STV, your ITV equivalent in in Scotland, um, the traditional uh, broadcast and, and advertising model. Um, they've got that business still. That's a bit that's under a bit of pressure. Revenues are down about 15% year on year there, given the macro as you might expect. Operating margins, again, you mentioned them, they're down a bit as well. Operating margins in this division, about 12%. They were 20, 22 at the last count. Mm. So, yes, that, but that will recover ultimately. You know, these these advertising led models do have an element of cyclicality about them and, and that that that's a good quality business it's still making a, a decent profit despite these challenges that's one part of it they've got then two other distinct buckets one of which is is a digital business that's the the set top box or the 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 um the uh, stv player the you know equivalent it's like the IT, itvx 
the equivalent exactly to, yeah. to to that up in Glasgow, up in Scotland. And it, again, that's a business which has been growing nicely for them. That's now 20 million of revenues. The management set out a three-year plan at the last set of results uh, a couple of weeks ago. And they said they think they can drive that up towards 30 million of revenues. Again, sensible margins, operating margins here about 50% at the last count. So again, a highly profitable part of the business. And then finally, you've got the studios business. Uh, which they've been building, and that's just inflected into profitability over the last year. It's now a leading UK production group. It's got 24 creative labels. Um, it, it, the, the current market's a little bit soft from a commissioning perspective, but they've got a good slate ahead of them. They've secured um, 87 million of revenues for this part of the business for 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 the, for the well, for March 24. That was up from 24 million in 2022. So seeing some really good growth here, and, and the business here thinks the management team think they can get this business up to about 140 million of revenues in the medium term by 2026. Um, the margins here. Best in class margins in the industry between 13 and 15 percent. They're a bit smaller, so they're saying they can get up to about 10 percent. If you take that 140 and a 10 percent margin, value it on between nine and 10 times because of what it is, it's a bit of scripted and a bit of unscripted. And you basically get the studio's business is worth more than the market cap of the total yeah. business than for broadcast and digital or in for free. I think that's the, the way of looking at it here. It's a studio business now, it's got a broadcast platform. But the studios are the growth, and, and that's really starting to come through for them now. And the market is not looking. Because the market's been looking at the EPS and the business. It's been going nowhere over the last couple of years as they've been investing in these these new these new um, new platforms. And that's now starting to come through. So I, I'm, I'm quite excited by this. Um, 4.9 times EV. But that, um, yeah, I think, again, it's one that people haven't really picked up on. Mm. Well, is there an opportunity to unbundle that? Because if they're doing commissions for other third parties your likes of netflix or anybody like that then there would be a sort of like an argument to say logically it should be outside of stv lapse in time i think right now they benefit from being under the one umbrella uh, but you're yeah, right okay. as a business grows and scales maybe there could be something to do there in due course okay good well let's move to um sort of gaming um services specialist uh we've got keyword studios which has been on a sort of like a a buy and build strategy for probably for the last 10 15 years and now it's a pretty pretty big business um and uh it, it's it's not really put a foot wrong um in terms of its actual performance but uh Obviously, in the last 12 months, there's been softness in the gaming side, and people have also, this is a bit of a battleground stock, have been questioning whether it's going to be a beneficiary or a victim of, of AI in terms of sort of like, you know, helping the big games publishers to develop and to localize and to, um, you know, dubbing and, and translation and distribution and stuff of, and, and testing of their particular um, games, et cetera. Can you take us through your, your latest thoughts on this one? Because uh, you can get, it seems to be a, a Marmite opinion here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it has been under the cosh a bit from, from the AI debate over the last year or so. Um, there, there was a, I'm sure you know, there was, a, there was a basket by an investment bank which was trying to short a bunch of companies. Which oh, really? They, I didn't know that. They associated with AI. This is one of them. Um, uh, and, and, yeah, so it, it, it created a few waves. Um, but ultimately, this is, a, this is a we met these guys last week. We brought on and the team into the office. Mm. It's a global business. It's a leading business. This is a business yeah. which has got, you know, a, a multiple. Um, it's an outsource, as you say, obviously. Uh, for game development, game localization, game testing, etc., it's a multiple the size of its nearest competitors. It still gets single digit market share. Uh, you know, as as a large studios and go through, you know, the process they're going through right now. Some people are are, are seeing some job reductions across the industry, which is always uh, unpleasant. But you know, these businesses clearly are are trying to right size for the market environment that we're in right now. We we're also in the, the COVID boom times. Mm -hmm. The market adjusted for that, and now we're coming through to a more normalized period. As the businesses need to address the, you know, these these different circumstances, they need to outsource more. And keywords are the quality outsourcer to 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 partner with, and they've got great relationships with the customer base. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, the 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 market is still. You know, it's it's a challenged market compared to where it was, but they're still delivering high single digits organic growth this year, plus acquisitions. It should drive about thirteen percent revenue growth for this business for this year. That's that's pretty attractive. And and talking to them last week, they would expect to get back to to low double digit growth from an organic perspective going forward. So, still in good shape. Still a massive runway for both an organic and an inorganic 
uh, perspective to continue to bolt on businesses. It's on 12 times. This is a global leading business and they're on the wrong multiple just because of some debates around AI. Yes, AI will change the landscape in the same way that computers change the landscape of which we've been operating in over our careers, Paul. I, I don't think it's going to uh, eradicate the, the need for um, a quality enterprise such as this business. Um, and I think they're they're in pretty good shape. But the debate has shifted. I think the debate when we first started talking about AI, with particularly this name, was, you know, AI is going to take away your business. And yeah. now AI is very much, AI is going to be seen as a tool to benefit your business and to, to improve efficiency and, and, and to potentially drive margins in the medium term. So I think it's an opportunity um, rather than a threat, certainly in in the timeline, the next three to five years. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it does look um, very generously priced on a uh, or cheaply priced on a you know sort of like for a, a world class trophy asset there with uh, real economies of scale. Okay, let's let's um, pivot to different sector. Healthcare. We've got H Vivo, which does um, challenge vaccine trials in the um, well, I think largely in the UK, etc. This one's done really, really well. I think it's a pretty dynamic um, CEO, uh, Mo Khan, and uh, they help uh, biotech companies launch their products by getting that that whole the whole testing process through quicker with better um, uh, data, et cetera. So do you want to take us through your latest on this one? Because uh, the shares have done very well over the last couple of years. Um, it's, yeah, leader in human challenge trials is basically taking um, healthy um uh, volunteers and 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 using them in the testing process. It basically does, as you say, expedite uh, the process. It, it it reduces cost as well. And it's still, you know, it's still a, it's not used in every trial yet. Um, but we think it's got some sub, some substantial momentum. Pfizer is the biggest partner that they've got a product to market with today. I think mm. certainly that's that's giving them some credibility. Um, that giving them the credibility that the, the, that the process works. It does what it says it should do and and these guys are the right guys to do it with they've got you know good levels of knowledge here it's it's a it's a it's a science here you know it's very hard to emulate what they're doing you and i can't open a, a clinic poll down the road and start testing these yeah. they, they need to have all the the data um and and you know need to know how exactly to 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 um design these studies in order to get the right results in order to make them um useful in in, in the trial process so um the, these guys know how to do it more can, as you say, is, is a bit of a force of nature. He's done a great job um, at refocusing this business. Uh, right now, it's got great levels of earnings, visibility, revenue, visibility. I think December 24 is fully done. Um, next year, again, they've got great levels of visibility and also for the following year as well, such as the nature of the business in which they operate. People want to contract them. Um, they are expanding their facilities. They're just opening a new site down in Canary Wharf um, in one of the towers down there. Um, and, and, you know, that gives them, you know, that that potential to continue to expand and build on the business. It's it's not cheaper than 19 times. Mm. Um, so you might sit here and say, well, I've missed it. But I don't think you have. I think the, the business itself has been very good at managing expectations. Uh, and we'd expect them to to deliver for their upgrades in due course as well. So, again, this is one. I don't think, I, I, again, I think it's relatively underknown. Um, but, again, a leading business in the UK uh, from a technology perspective, focus on healthcare, obviously, but uh, doing a great job. Yeah, no, I would agree. Absolutely. OK, well, let's keep into the same sector. Let's move to another one, which did a big acquisition, actually, last week. Advanced Medical Solution, which is a sort of niche specialist in wound care, does, I think, sort of like stitches and it does glues, adhesives, you know, to, and, you know, uh, uh, products that actually help people heal after sort of like injuries and stuff like that. It bought a big um, sort of rival, I think, or a complementary business, Peter Surgical, last week for about 141 million euros on, on a sort of 12 to, to 13 times EBITDA multiple, which is a bit higher than actually their current multiple, which I think sort of brought the shares down. Just you take us through your, your, the latest on this one, because I know they'd been struggling a bit with growth, and this one seems to have been, it seems to be a real transformational acquisition for them. I think struggling with growth is a bit unfair. They had to go through a process in the US, I think, with regards to getting their own products in, their own brand branded products in. So that caused a bit of a hiatus. I think a year or 18 months ago, they had a bit of a an issue with, with that. But that was dealt with, and, and they're now in a much stronger footing from, from that perspective. So I think mm. the underlying business is actually in pretty good shape. Um, but you're right, the Peter's surgical business, we met these guys last week as well. Um, th this is complimentary, as you say. It takes them into France, obviously, um, in, in a big way. Um, but again, it takes them into into um, a slightly different product set, which they 
think they can they can monetize more effectively um, under under their 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 umbrella uh, and with their their customer relationships. Again, we think it's it's, it's it makes sense. You're right, and the, you know the, the shares have been under a bit of pressure over the last week or so, given given the deal. But we we think it's it's the right thing to be doing. Um, the business itself is on about nine times EV EBITDA, so it's not expensive. Um, and as you say, I think this does give them that that next leg and 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 you know some potentially very exciting upside from here. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, you, you know, you'd have thought there'd be high recurring revenue streams. And again, operating the healthcare sector, there's lots of barriers to entry into it. You can't just rock up there and supply some stitches. And you and I get... couldn't do it next week. No, you're absolutely right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Let's move pivot to another um, sector. Let's go to consumer. We've got a Nichols, which is your, your Vimto owner, came out with some uh, year-end results uh, last week. Can you give us your latest on this one? What, what, what sort of attracted you to it? Because obviously it's not an iconic, well, I mean, it is an iconic brand, Vimto, but it's not. It's more of a local taste rather than actually a, a Coke or a Pepsi. I believe you said that, Paul. Try telling that to people of Manchester. Sorry about this that. This is yeah. an iconic, an iconic asset. It is an iconic, yes. <laughs> Um, Nichols about 400 million market cap. Vimto is a lead product, um, as you say, of which it continues to develop and expand and and take more space in the supermarkets. UK business is still growing. Um, UK package is up about two percent, one and a half percent. So despite some market challenges and a, a, you know a, 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 a more you know steady macro environment, they're still delivering growth here but actually it's the international business that's that's really going great guns for them it's up about six percent um middle east uh, and africa in particular it's got a big um a big ramadan uh link it, it is has it, it? Is used, <laughs> it has yes that's what drives that business and it's it, it, it's i think it's, it, there's, there's a i can't i'm not quite the stat wrongly but they've been in with, with in the middle east with with Ramadan, this is used as a sort of celebration. You go into these supermarkets, these massive displays. Well, I never know that. So, um, yes, well, it's it, 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 you, we and I, you and I obviously don't tend to go over there for Ramadan, but it certainly is, an, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it, it, it has been a great uh, foothold for them into that market using using Ramadan, and they're 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 expanding elsewhere within Africa as well. So, the the international business it's it's, it's hard to quantify the exact revenues because ultimately they sell. Uh, they concentrate into these countries, and then obviously they sell on from there. They have a, they have a partner, or a couple of partners in, in those countries. But you know, the, roughly the revenues for Vimto in, in the international markets is the same uh, retail revenues or similar retail revenues to the UK numbers as well. So it's a scale operation, uh, a good balance sheet uh, within this one as well. Sixty-seven million of cash, um, and they're they're on the lookout for deals. They have been on the lookout for deals for some time. But again, we had these guys in last week, and I, I think. Um, we think something's fairly imminent. We'd expect something to hopefully come at some point in the next year. So let's wait and see. We have thought that in the past. But it's on 16 times earnings, 10 times EV with that. So it's a, a, a quality business, you know, good balance sheet. You know, you know, it's got a great foothold in parts of the UK, maybe not Boston your supermarket, Paul, but elsewhere. Um, and it's got some really good international presence as well. So I think it's it's much more exciting than people perhaps are, are, are aware of. And, you know, it has got much more opportunity ahead of it. Yeah, and also I would have thought actually, you know, given it, I, I, did, I did use the wrong words, so apologies for that. Given it is an iconic brand, I would actually say that, uh, you know, it could get, it could be a takeover target. I know we haven't really talked on, but there's plenty, plenty of acquisition targets, and AJ Barr would be a perfect fit for these. I personally, I would have thought. Anyway, I mean, I know them, they're your Scottish link with the, the Iron Brew owners, but. You know, it, it is sort of thing. It's a portfolio. It, it, it's something you can't replicate, can you? J Bar, another iconic drink in a different part yes. of the country. But um, <laughs> I, Nichols, I'd be surprised. There's a big family ownership here. Um, oh, the Nichols okay. family is still a big percentage. It'll be ultimately up to them. But um, but yeah, it, it would fit within a bigger business. But ultimately, on its own, it's still doing the right thing, still generating cash. Um, and you know, we think it's got a good opportunity as an independent business. Yeah, okay. All right, okay. Well, let's move to stay in the consumer, but more of a counter cycle. We've got H and T, which is the mm. UK's biggest uh, pawn broker. The shares surprisingly have been quite weak. I think it had a bit of a trade, a, a sort of profit warning just before Christmas. Really, not on its pawn broking, which is going from strength to strength, but largely on its retail arm. Anyway, it came out with numbers uh, just re just just the last couple of weeks, I think, and they were pretty good. So the shares have m moved up again. Still very cheap though. What's your what's your sort of your latest on this one? 
game. We had these guys in last week. It's been a very busy period with results, um, as, as you're aware. Mm. Yes, the leading UK pawn broker this year has had a torrid few months. Um, when the, the group announced earlier in the year, you say, you say profit warning, but the group announced it will deliver profit growth of 40% yeah. for the year, not the 50% it had in the market or whatever it was, 55 It was just a case of management uh, or, or management of expectations management of consensus expectations um uh, and and that you know, the, that was a mistake sadly that um that, that did impact the share price i mean looking ahead to the next few few years of market i was about 10 percent profit growth for for this year and, uh, and next it feels much uh, more sensibly placed um but it is doing a good job it, it, it is still growing both organically and inorganically. Recently, did a uh, did a, a, a bought a, a, a one large store, um, which name which name escapes me. But um, but again, it, it, you know these are uh, it, it just helps cement their footprint within different parts of the country. It's trading on about six times, six point six yeah. times to December uh, twenty five. You know, given that level of growth, I talked about forty percent profit growth in the forecast, ten percent ish going forward. That still feels to be the wrong price it should be trading you know, you know i'm not saying this is a, a high uh rated business going forward but it certainly should trade 10 to 12 times and that's double the current level so um in the meantime we're getting paid a five percent dividend yield so it's unfortunate profit warning is, is what it's associated with but actually it still delivered yeah. fantastic growth over the period yeah it got sort of like wrongly labeled really wasn't it i mean it was a, it was a, it was a sort of like pat the back type of result you did a really good job but you got <laughs> Because they put the bar so high, they got accidentally slated, which which was ridiculous. Okay, let's move That's to another important. one. We've got a train line, which came out with results last week, and the uh, shares ticked up sort of 10 15%. Obviously, people probably know this one from uh, booking rail tickets in the UK and coach fares and stuff like that. But mm. it also has got a, a growing um, uh, European business as well. Do you want to take us through this one? Because... Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's not it's not optically that cheap, but um, you can't replicate it. I mean, it's got huge network effects, so to speak. I know, pardon the pun, but um, look, this one did manage expectations properly. Um, and a very strong recent trading update. Revenues are about four hundred million. Um, that's up twenty percent. The guidance they gave to the market was between uh, fifteen and twenty percent margins. Um, two point three percent of net sales again above where the previous guidance was. So they they did deliver there. Um, and the business is growing as you say. It's it's got that network effect. Uh, UK growth is still uh, twenty plus percent. Um, but it's all about the international. As you said, international was up was up fourteen, but that masks what was happening. There, you know, different markets growing at different paces given where they are within uh with with within their their development. Spain and Italy grew at about forty. 43% combined other markets were more subdued in part as they stepped back from France in particular uh, until that market developed. So um, you're, you're seeing fantastic levels of growth in certain areas across mm -hmm. Europe there. And you're right, it's not cheap. It's on tw high 20s on a, on a price to earnings multiple. But if they can deliver in Europe, then this still has a long way to go. That's ultimately what you're, you're buying it for. UK done. It's got that great market position. And it's just cementing that and it will be cash generative and whatever else to be fantastic. But ultimately, you want to see that European growth come through. Uh, and when it does, you know, I think the shares have still got some some significant momentum from here. Mm. And it must have huge data, you know, sort of like, you know, capture there as in like this must have value rather than just offering a service. There must be something on that data, whether it's, you know, helping other adjacent products move into this market to upsell whatever i don't know but uh you probably find there's some monetary aspect that you can do with all that data at some point okay let's move to uh, yeah let's move to sanderson designs which is a sort of like a, a luxury internal design furnishing firm they do wallpapers and fabrics and paints and stuff like that reminds me a bit of uh, the laura ashley kudos sort of years and years ago sort of like really you know well sought after etc the shares given the you know the, the the sentiment towards all things sort of like building related are really really cheap but it's got a rock solid balance sheet and i know it's licensing quite a bit of its um, designs out internationally um, and also doing pretty well out in the US as well. Should you take us through this one? It, it, I mean, it looks mispriced to me, even though obviously it's a it's a difficult, challenging area. No, it's it's right at the the other end of the the, the market cap spectrum from trade line. Seventy five million market cap. This one is, is trading on right now. It's a UK based luxury 
interior business. It's got a number of brands. I'm looking at them here. Zoffany, Sanderson, Morris, Harlequin. Um, you know, these are quality names that that, that my wife likes to, to stock our house yeah. with. So it's, you know, this is, you know, quality product. Um, and you're right. So it's been a trickier market, particularly at that end of the last, you know, couple of years, given what we've seen with the economy, et cetera. But these will recover. This business has been well managed. Um, the licensing business in particular, just say, is delivering for them. The, the full year trading update a couple of weeks ago was in line largely because licensing has, has been has been so solid for them. But they are, you know, the the the. the the, the the core business itself is in pretty good shape. The the, the, the manager team, Lisa Montague, came into the business about mm. five years ago and, and has done a great job there with streamlining various aspects of the operations. Uh, you're right, the balance sheet is great as well. It's got 16 million of cash in the balance sheet. Um, it's paying a 3.5% yield right now. So, you know, you being paid to wait. Um, it's on eight times earnings, three and a half times EV bit da. But but ultimately, you know, there is substantial upside as and when the, the, the micro recovers and, and this business capitalizes on that. Yeah, oh, I would agree. And I think that's a perfect segue, actually, to one of the house builders. You've got MJ uh, Gleason in your portfolio, which does affordable houses, I think, in the sort of the northeast and in the, in the Midlands, et cetera. So not not your sort of central London, but um, they are they came out with the trading. And they also, the house builders all seem to be saying the same thing. It's been a tough 18 months, in, particularly after the sort of the Liz, Liz Trust sort of like saga with the LDI crisis when interest rates shot up. But now that people are expecting interest rates to fall down, swap markets have reduced, meaning the availability and the, and the affordability of mortgages increased. So they're starting to see all the house builders increasing football, football at their sites, including MJ Gleason. Do you want to take the, the shares have recovered from their October lows, no doubt about it, but they still trade it just slightly above, sort of like you know, net assets, etc. And this is a business, it's it's there's two aspects to it. There's a land business which focuses on the south of the country, which is basically selling your know, options on or buying yeah. options on lands, getting planning consent for them and selling them on relatively low in capital required, but it's a skilled business. But that's that, that's a bit lumpier, but the business that we really get excited about is this this house builder in areas of economic regeneration. Um, it's it's you know it's a fantastic product. It, you can buy a house from MJ Gleason and pay less than you would do in your council house rent. Um, you can because ultimately the the, the, the selling price is um, at such an attractive level. Uh, these houses are much more uh, energy efficient as well, so your running costs are again much lower. And they and they sell to people. Um, you know, it, it it can be a couple. They, they can be on, um, you know, I think that the, the, the example they, they, they use is um, he, the, 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 the husband drives a bus and, and she works in, in the local supermarket and they can, their combined salary is enough to enable them, them to get a, a quality home. And it's an area, they, they, they tend to sell to people who are, you know, live within one mile of the site. So it's in a local environment. People, you know, it, it, I get it. It helps that community aspect. You're not building out a greenfield in the middle of nowhere. It's regeneration of brownfield sites. So lots of environmental, social uh, aspects to this business that we really like. Um, the returns are pretty good from the house building perspective, mid teens, which is, you know, perfectly uh, credible. Um, and it's, you're right, it, it has recovered. It's on 14 times now and it's multiple. So it's a little bit above where it would be in a normal market. But, you know, this business is due to deliver 35 pence of earnings this year. If you look back to, to June 2022, it delivered almost 80 pence. So, the, you know, there is a long way to go here for this business. Um, got newish chief exec in place. Um, he's doing a great job, we think. Um, and, and, and just refocusing the business on on, on costs and and and, and quality, etc. Um, and I, I think this business, again, is in fantastic shape over the medium term. It's relatively unique. Nobody else really does what they do apart from one other private business called Keep Moat. So it's a market they have. For some reason, got to themselves right now as other house builders focus elsewhere, um, but they're being able to deliver decent returns, you know, with with potential for a lot more growth as 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 the economy and, and the market recovers and interest rates normalise, as you said. Yeah, well, and also assuming that uh, Labour wins the election at the end of the year, they could see you know affordable housing, social housing, and you know that sort of stuff could get a real sort of political boost. So. Uh, yeah, well, um, it should be in perfect position. Um, they sell to first-time buyers. I mean, that's a that's their focus is 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 yeah. a young under thirty-five market. And you're right, the the next government, whoever it is, Labour or Tory, are always want to are always going to want to encourage home ownership amongst the younger generations. It's something which we need to encourage in the UK, um, and these guys are one company that's facilitating that. Mm. 
And another sort of trend, of, I think, on sort of housing and stuff, both on you know existing properties and new properties, premiumization. That takes us to a brick maker we got in the portfolio, Michaelmers, which is a sort of premium brick manufacturer. They're sort of, they're sort of like uh, you know fairly niche, uh, good looking, aesthetically pleasing type uh, products, either whether they're bricks or you know for for for, for properties or for actual um infrastructure as well they go into railway stations and this sort of stuff again the shares are bombed out at building products but they've got a rock solid balance sheet and it's just really waiting for this recovery and if the house builders presumably do start you know breaking new ground these guys are going to well positioned to to take the uh you know to benefit from it i mean as you say these are quality assets um they're the product they make is harder to be replicated by imports and, and by some of the the more mass market um uh, manufacturers so they're very much specialist products higher price point protects them uh, from that perspective and they also were quite careful during the price up environment the inflationary times not to be um to be moving things around too much i think other people perhaps in the space were doing so um but michael merch were very much of the view that that doesn't you know that 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 is difficult to manage from a customer perspective and mm -hmm. their own customers they wanted to uh to 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 keep those relationships so you know they've done well the last update in november was in line um that that was despite you know the difficult market giving given the, the, the lower level of housing starts the business is in, is in good shape as you say it's well invested it's a quality asset base um, and you're right, it's it's cheap some five times EV but da. Uh, um so it, it is one that we we hold in the portfolio on the premise that it will recover uh, when the market recovers. It's paying us a four percent dividend yield right now to wait. Um we're 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 not worried about it. You know, I'm not expecting a recovery in the next few months. I don't yeah. think the volumes are gonna come back in the next few months, but um we would expect them to be back um in the next year or so. And and these guys are very very well placed for for, for market recovery. The results are next week. Uh, let's see what they say. Um, but you know, it's one we've held for a long time. We like this business. We like how it's managed, and 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 uh, we like the asset base. Yeah. Okay. Good. Another one in that sort of the same vein, well managed, and uh, you know, sort of like uh, just just w waiting for a, a top turn is Almasac, which basically does sort of drain management systems and uh, vents and stuff like that, but largely into commercial property rather mm -hmm. than actually into 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 buildings, etc. Rather than actually into the um, into the residential sector, came out with results just recently, pretty good, um, and they've got a you know big payment. You know, we've got six percent dividend yield, sort of seven seven times PE, very cheap. Um, what's your sort of your later? I'm guessing it's a similar sort of thing. You know, just good quality asset. Uh, I mean, uh, it's all you ask. They, they, they're, they're they say specialist building products. You've got three divisions: water management and building envelope, very much commercial, and then a house building products business which they are developing which is growing strongly relatively small at this stage um but but really we think it's got fantastic potential um upside um it's it's you know again tricky end markets as you say but the first half numbers were robust i think they delivered 12 percent growth in profits despite uh one large contract at um at hong kong airport that that slipped um but they still expect to get it but they're you know it's not in the numbers right now um, and you're right, it's cheap. My, my numbers are 6.4 times on a price to earnings and a 6.4% yeah. dividend yield. So, you know, that, that's very odd, very rare. You see that that th those two uh, multiples meet, um, but you're being paid to wait here as well. It's Look, it's it's not it's not going to race away, but it's a very solid business that will grow, will recover. Uh, and I, we do think these three core platforms have got really strong potential for, for, for upside in the medium term. It, it's a business you come out of the meetings just thinking they could be, um, really start to accelerate when things get much better. So it's it's, it's not expensive. It's got that yield, mm. um, and it's got the upside potential in due course. Yeah, and and I'm guessing also there's a long term secular tailwind to sort of improve energy efficiency and water utilization. That um, you know, go governments around the Western world want buildings to become you know better users of of the natural resources. So uh, it it's got a benefit from that, I guess. Absolutely, I think that, that yeah. some of the products they, they provide to 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 feature within that you know yeah. that perspective um, particularly highly. But that, again, that, that gets us yeah. excited when we meet them. But um... yeah, okay, good. Okay, well, let's move to the final section. We've got sort of financials. We've got fintel, which is all things sort of like financial services and data providers for investors, for IFAs, and for product providers. Again, it's it's a bit of a done a bit of a buy and build, but it hasn't put a foot wrong and. Uh, it's got good. It's got good growth, both organic and by acquisition. And uh, I was just looking at the actual margin, sort of twenty-five percent EBIT margin. So it must be doing something right. <laughs> uh, 
No, it's, it's, well, it, it came to market as, as Simply Biz, which some of your customers right. and clients might know. Um, and, and then it, it bought De Facto, which is also a great brand um, and, and obviously rebranded Fintel. It's, it's, you know, you're right, it's a business which we think has got a good platform. It, it's not, again, it was not super cheap, 20 odd times in a multiple, but um, we, we think it's got great scope for, for medium term growth. Uh, the, the, the joint chief executives have done a great job there, uh, we, we think, in building this platform. Um, and embedding themselves within the IFA network in particular, and I think they've got some substantial potential growth in due course. It's it, it's it, it's just a nice business with a lot of bits to it, operating within that ecosystem. Um, that I think they'll monetize in time. Yeah, I would agree. And there's quite a lot of um, M and A going off in that market as well. So you never know; it could be one of those yeah. trophy assets that are bought out. Okay, good. Let's move to another one. We've got uh, Frank or Topping, which is. Uh, I, th I think they've actually just got a new chairman, Mr. Christopher Mills from um, from Harwood. So and he's got 30%, which seems to be quite interesting. The shares haven't performed that well over a sort of two-year perspective, but effectively they're a specialist uh, sort of advisor, consultant to help people do claims and then manage their, cla their effectively their compensation in their wealth management division. So they're, they're a bit vertically integrated, but very, very unique. You take, they trade it, I mean, like the whole of the asset managers, very cheaply, 12 times PE with cash on the balance sheet. Yeah, I think this is one that is, you say is unique. It is unique, we think. It's got this um, this in vertical integrated, as you, as you talk about, way that they build their business. They advise these customers, these clients, these people who go through these issues, which is, you know, sadly is, yeah. is far more prevalent than you like to, to think. But it... But they they do help with the process of 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 running the claim, managing the claim, settling the claim, and then managing the asset. Which you know it it, it is a business which they do they do well. Um, they they are growing their asset base. I think assets under management are over one point three five billion now, up from one point yeah. one point two. Am I right saying last year? So they're still delivering good levels of growth. You're right. The business hasn't quite delivered from an earnings, from a uh, a share price perspective, but the underlying operations are, are 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 doing what they said they would do. I think it's a little bit overlooked. People don't know it that well yet. Um, I think perhaps the, the profile needs to be raised. Uh, but Richard Fraser, chief exec, you know, I think he's he lives and breathes this business. He's doing a very good job there. Um, I, I, I we firmly believe it's it's too cheap. It's paying a three percent dividend yield right now. It's on about 11 times the earnings. I think these businesses should trade on you know, 13, 14, 15 times the earnings. So there's decent upside from, from that perspective uh, as and when um, the market wants to look back towards this end. of the, the, I think what's what's happened here is lots of the stocks in this end of the market are being discounted because, you yes. know, be, because of the environment we're in, because of the, um, you know, we talked about flows into asset managers earlier on. And I think, you know, there's a, the, there's been a sell-off in these the, the the sector in general, and this has come down with 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 that. I think ultimately, you know, it, it should re-rate. It should get back up to those mid-teens uh, multiples, and, and the share price should react over time. Yeah, and it comes down to what we talked about originally with all those, you know, fund manager redemptions across the whole industry, and that's taken the wind out of investor sentiment. And uh, uh, and so it's not using liquid this stock. If you have a small seller, it's going to yeah. drive the share price down, which I think I think is what we've been seeing. So yeah, another one which in that sector, the last one is Premier Mighton, which is a specialist boutique sort of like a UK fund manager. They had uh, Gervais Williams, I think he's one of their sort of the smaller cap guys that the investors will probably know, and the shares have sold off. They're you know mostly active sort of like you know investment platform um it, it, across the whole you know I industry 10 billion of uh, i think of um of AUM so um and they're trading at a, what about 100 million just less than 100 million market cap can you take us through this one because again it's it's just looks stupidly priced given they've got a big rock solid balance sheet like again it's it's as i said before the whole sector has been sold off in sympathy to concerns about the market and you know resulting you know liquidity as you talked about earlier on people selling down some of the stocks and and, and limited buyers around right now but you're right this is super cheap you know single digit multiple it's got ambitions to double its AUM which I think they'll do, do over the medium term they got newish uh, sales head of sales in the business Joffy who's who's is very up for it if you meet him he's, he is a bit of a force of nature I think he's he's, he's going to be quite key to driving this business forward and taking it into new new markets. Um, and yeah, you, you, yeah, you're right. You've been paid to wait right now. The dividend yield is 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 material. It's I think it's ten percent. You know, if, if that gets reduced a bit, we will mind. Yeah. You know, but you know, it's it, again. You're paid to wait for this business to recover. It will recover. It you will 
make a substantial return when the markets feel happier about life, when people start to ask to allocate towards active management, towards, you know, you mentioned Gervais, um, but there are a number of other fund managers in there, obviously, active managers within the stable. Um, they will all benefit from increased flows. And, and given the operating platform here, you'd expect to see uh, the earnings multiple uh, uh, progress as well as the EPS progress. So I think this business right now is on trough earnings, trough multiple, big dividend yields. It, it will recover. Yeah. And then just, I mean, just stepping back, I think you raise a really good point in the fact that if you operate in the small cap area, because liquidity is quite, you know, low, et cetera, unless you get in before the correct, you know, the, the, the upswing, into, then you won't get another chance because these things happen quite quickly, don't they? I guess. Has, has we got any, any thoughts? You don't know when, but when they do, they'll be moving up quite rapidly. I think what's interesting right now is you talk to the market makers, if you bid them for stock, they, they, they're not sitting with a lot of stock in the books. And, that, and that's because the markets have been a bit volatile, obviously, over the last couple of years, and they don't want to be seen to be holding losses. So um, you, you're right. When, when, when people come on to buy many of these companies, there isn't a lot of liquidity around, and it does move the price quite quite quickly. So uh, when that happens, Paul, I don't know. Mm. What's the catalyst? I don't know. Interest rates? Yes. The British ISA last week, I think, was helpful. Um, other you know, initiatives might also be helpful. Um, some IPOs would be good. Um, but look, ultimately, we're sitting here at a market you know, in the UK, which is super cheap, 40% discount to its global peers. We're sitting with the small cap end of the market at a 20% discount to large cap peers, i.e. Mm. a double discount within yeah. the smaller end of the space. Um, these are these are valuations which we haven't seen since the global financial crisis. This doesn't stay, these don't stay around here for very long. Now is the time that investors need to be looking at small mid cap equities because ultimately, um, in eighteen months' time, you will be sitting on a potentially material profit should conditions normalise, and we fully expect them to do so. The economy in the UK isn't in bad shape, despite what the press might tell us. We've had the ONS upgrade the UK economy twice over the last year. We're not the sick man of Europe. We're very much in line with other developed economies. It's not fantastic, but it's not dreadful. And this year, we think we'll deliver modest um, economic growth. Um, that doesn't justify the valuations of our equity market. It is it is super cheap. Um, and you know if we don't um, realise that, if investors don't realise that, we're going to continue to see takeouts, as we see almost every day, a company bid for at a... Often, you know, I think the average premium last year was 70%. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, you know, and, and these companies aren't being bought at that premium because the buyer thinks they're there for fair value. The buyer is buying them with the view that they're still cheap at that level. So um, that's not fully reflective of the upside case here. We think that, that this market's got a long way to go. Um, let's, 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 let's wait and see what happens. Yeah, well, that's a good uh, optimistic point to uh, to finish it off. Get and also sort of like get ahead in get ahead of the curve, I guess, when when this thing uh, does happen. But before we sort of finish there, Chris, if somebody wants to invest in the octopus funds or in the smaller, you know, your small cap fund, how how best to do that? We're on on all platforms, Paul, as you might expect. We have three funds: the FP Octopus Multi Cap Income Fund, which is why I was talking about some yields. Um, we got FP Octopus UK Market Cap Growth Fund, uh, which is some of the smaller names we've discussed today, and the FP Octopus UK Multi um, UK Future Generations Fund, which is a more thematic fund uh, based around sustainability, environment, uh, people, places, planets, all that sort of good stuff. So we're on we're on all platforms. So please, and if you wanted to speak to me, please just drop me a line. I'm very happy to have a call. Yeah, good. Okay, well, uh, I strongly suggest investors to have a look through many of those iconic names in that portfolio, <laughs> particularly uh, particularly the ones I get wrong. Okay, yeah. Guy, well, thanks very much, um, uh, Chris, and look forward to touching base in six months' time. See you, Paul. Thank you.